going to be sure and pray for Brother Tom today and as he's having the opportunity to preach to thousands of young people and uh, make an impact on their lives that will literally make a difference in their entire lives. And uh, I appreciate him asking me to fill the pulpit in his absence. Uh, take your Bibles or your phone, instruments, whatever you use to read the scriptures and uh, turn to two passages of scripture, one in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and then in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 10 and Deuteronomy chapter 11. We'll look at those in just a few minutes. felt like uh, as a college student uh, maybe you've just graduated but you haven't yet found that first job your career where you're going to be employed and uh, you just feel like you don't know exactly what to do with yourself you're in between or maybe you're a builder and you've just finished the last big project you've been completed it you kind of put it to bed you've got another phase you're going to get into but you're not yet quite ready to start it and uh, and you're just in between or maybe as a parent and uh, that last, the youngest child has started first grade. And uh, you've got that empty nest syndrome, and you're kind of thinking about having, well, maybe I shouldn't go there. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's a tender subject. <laughs> but, but you know what I'm saying. You're, you're in between. And, and, and we're sort of in between times right now. Uh, the old year is behind us and the new year is before us and, and that's, uh, that's where the children of Israel found themselves in the text that we're going to be reading in a few minutes and, uh, and it's very appropriate uh, for us to look at it today because uh, we also, I'm convinced as I try to analyze where we are as a church, I, I feel like we're... Uh, we're in a, in an in-between time. Uh, Brother Tom has been here uh, just long enough to really uh, get established, and wonderful things have happened. Uh, we're, he's learned all of our names, amazingly to me, how well he's learned so many names so quickly. And, uh, and we're, as you've already heard Mike make the announcement from executive pastor position, the possibility of calling another staff member, and, and so we've just completed such a fabulous uh, year, and yet there's another year just uh, on the cusp of beginning, and I'm convinced great things uh, are happening and have happened, but so much greater things are just about to begin happening in the life of our church. And uh, I, uh, I, I feel like that's the place that the children of Israel found themselves in, in, the, in the text that we're going to be looking at. And it's important that we consider this text because the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, in, in the Corinthians uh, correspondence in chapter 10, he tells us that God gave this experience and he saw to it that it was recorded in his word because it was an example for believers on this side of the cross. Let's read that, and I'm going to read more than the sixth verse that was listed, let's, let's, so you can get the context of it. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, and, and let's just listen to that. 
For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they all drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now listen to this next verse, verse 6. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Now drop down to verse 10. <clears throat> and do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. And again, he repeats it. These things happened to them as examples and were re written down or recorded as a warning for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. He makes it so plain that all these things happened to the children of Israel that we're going to look at in the book of Deuteronomy in just a moment. He says that these things happened as an example and a warning for us that we not repeat the same mistakes that they made and that we look forward to the new opportunities that are before us with a vision that perhaps they, not, they did not have. So let's look back now to the text in Deuteronomy, realizing as we read it and as we hear it, looking forward into this new year, realizing that we've got a great opportunity before us. Let's begin with verse 10. The land you are entering to take over is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, for you planted your seed and irrigated it by foot as in a vegetable garden. But the land you are crossing the Jordan to take possession of is a land of mountains and valleys that drinks rain from heaven. It is a land the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are continually on it from the beginning of the year to its end. So, if you faithfully obey the commands I'm giving you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will send rain from on your land in its seasons, both autumn and spring rains, so that you may gather in your grain new wine and olive oil. I will provide grass in the fields for your cattle and you will eat and be satisfied. Be careful or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you and he will shut up the heavens so that it will not rain and the ground will yield no produce and you will soon perish from the good land the Lord is giving you. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them uh, as, as you sit at home and and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up, write them on your door frames of your houses and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord your swore to give your ancestors as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. If you carefully observe all these commands I am giving you to follow, to, to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him and to Hold fast to him, then the Lord will drive out all the nations before you, and, you're, and you will dis dispossess nations larger and stronger than you. Now listen to this 24th verse. Every place you set your foot will be yours. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the Euphrates River to the Mediterranean Sea. There are several truths in here, in these verses, that 
I'm going to call to our attention today and show you that they have application to us and, and in our situation as we close out a year and enter into a new year, as we see the blessings of God just behind us, but also we see the tremendous opportunities that are right before us. The first truth that I would uh, call to your attention is that the, the pathway that we will travel in the next year and the years just ahead of us may not be an easy way, may be a difficult pathway. In, in that uh, 11th verse, look at it again, uh, the 10th verse, it says, The land you are entering to take over is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you planted your seed and irrigated it by foot as a vegetable garden. The land you're crossing the Jordan to take possession of is a land of mountains and valleys. In other words, uh, in, in Egypt where they had been settled in the land of Goshen, it was in the Nile River Delta. It was a land that was flat and, and uh, it, it was very fertile and uh, it, it, it was very easy uh, for them to settle there and to plant their gardens and have them irrigated from the Nile River. And he was saying to them that the land that you're entering into is a land of valleys and hills. It's going to be highs and lows, both figuratively and literally, before you. Uh, in other words, you're going to have highs and lows. You're going to have uh, mountaintop experiences with the Lord of great victory, like at Jericho, where the walls will literally come crumbling down. And you're going to have times of defeat, which they did, at Ai, where they disobeyed the Lord and they were defeated by a much smaller village than Jericho, the walled city. And so it was true that they had highs and lows. And you say, well, what's the lesson in that for us? We know already that, that there were highs and lows. Well, that's not a lesson. You know that already. But the lesson is that we need the highs and the lows. You see, I, I don't know about you, whether you are like I am, but I would not choose, if I have the choice, I wouldn't choose the lows. I would live on the mountaintop of high experiences with the Lord, close to the Lord all the time. I would never choose the low and discouraging times if I was given the choice. But the, the fact is we need to realize that we need both the highs and the lows. Well, why is that, Brother? Because it's in the low times, in the discouraging times, that, that we draw closer to the Lord and we hear the, the lessons that the Lord would teach us more, much more clearly than we do when we're on the uh, easy times and the mountaintop experiences with the Lord. You see, some wise man, much wiser than I am, uh, once said that, God whispers to us on the mountaintops, but he shouts to us in the valleys. And we learn those lessons that we need to learn, the spiritual lessons, much more clearly when we're in the valley of despair. So we need both. But be careful not, not to miss another truth in this 11th verse. And that is that uh, even though it may be a difficult way that we will be traveling, the land will drink rain from heaven. In other words, God is going to be, be providing for us in a supernatural way. In, uh, Moses was reminding the people of Israel that when they lived in Egypt, they watered their crops by the sweat of their brow and the labor of their backs and their arms. They made irrigation channels from the Nile River that never ran dry, even in times of drought. The Nile is like the Mississippi River here in America. Even in drought, it doesn't run dry. And so if they labored hard enough and dug the channels for the water to irrigate their crops, they could always raise crops in Egypt. But he said in the, in the, it won't be that way in the land of Israel. You'll have to depend on God to send rain from the heavens. You'll have to depend upon God to provide for you. It's, in other words, it's, you're going to have to depend. It's going to be a spiritual dependency 
in the land that you're going to be conquering and that God is going to give to you. It's been my observation that most modern-day Christians are living closer to the example of Egypt than, in other words, than we are to the way of the Palestine, the, the Israelites in conquering Palestine. By that I mean how, how much that goes on in the modern-day church can only be explain, explained in terms of God did it. How much? I, my experience, I feel like most of what happens today can be explained in, in terms of human hard work and dedication and not we had to depend on God for this. We walked by faith for this. You see what I mean? So there's a spiritual lesson in that. As we go into this new year, as we go into the future, the challenge of the future, we may be walking a difficult path of valleys and, and hillsides, but God will provide for all of our needs. God will be our source, and we may have to walk by faith and depend upon the rain that comes from heaven that only God can provide. There's a second lesson here, and it's in verse 12. He says, look at it, let me read it to you again. It is the land the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are continually on it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Do you see the point? It's a land your God cares for. The words your God reminds them that God is a personal God. That God is very close to them and he is very personal with them. And the eyes of the Lord are continually on your way. You may be walking a way of difficulty, but God's eyes are upon you, and he cares for you very much. A few years ago, there was a popular song that went like this. God is watching. God is watching. God is watching from a distance. Well, that song was partially true. God is watching, but not from a distance. He's watching uh, from a nearby. He's watching over the single mother or dad who's struggling to provide for children without another parent in the home. He's watching over the widow, a widower who is living on a fixed income without, uh, as their health is gradually uh, beginning to deteriorate. God is watching over the parent who is struggling with problems in the workplace. God's watching over the troubled teenager uh, dealing with peer pressure problems. God's watching uh, over the orphaned child without parents to help raise them. God, the, the Second Chronicles 16, 8 through 10 says, the eyes of the Lord run to and from throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. As we enter this new year, we enter it knowing that we are under the watchful eye of God. And he said, God's eyes continually on it from the beginning of the year to its end. But there's a third lesson. That, and and it's possibly, probably the most important one of all. In that 13th through the 15th verse, he says there, so if you're faithful to obey the commands I'm giving you today to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and all your soul. Oh my goodness, that is the most important one of all. We must love the Lord our God with all that we are and obey his words very carefully. You know, there is a main purpose for almost everything that is invented. Uh, now, there may be secondary things that uh, uh, something is able to accomplish, but there's always one primary thing that, that, that an item is intended to accomplish. Let me use an example of an umbrella. Uh, and and uh, you always want this item to accomplish its main purpose. If it doesn't accomplish its main purpose, you, it's really no good to you. 
no matter how impressive it may look, I, I've, got a, I've got an umbrella at, at home in my closet. If I had that umbrella, I should have thought to bring it. If I had that umbrella with me, you'd be real impressed. Because it, it looks like a, only an important person would carry that umbrella. There's just one problem. When I put it up, it won't stay up. It folds down. It does not keep me dry in a rainstorm. Now, tell me, wouldn't you rather have an ugly, ragged, faded old umbrella that will stay up and keep the rain off of you than a real, than a real impressive, pretty umbrella? I would. Why? Because it accomplishes the purpose for which it was invented or created. Well, what is the main purpose for which you and I were born again into the family of God? Well, I'm glad you asked because I'm going to tell you. And it's not my idea. I get it right straight out of the Bible. A lawyer asked Jesus that question one day. What is the greatest commandment, Lord? And Jesus said in Matthew 22, 37, he said, the, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment. The most important thing to God that we do is to give him our undivided love and loyalty. Above all else. Now, there's a lot else he wants us to do. Sure enough. But the first thing he wants from us is our wholehearted love. First and foremost. And do you know why that's so? It's because if, if you're giving God your undivided, your wholehearted love, you're much less likely to be unfaithful to your marriage partner. And you're, if you're giving God your wholehearted love, first love above all else, you're much more likely to be kind and generous and faithful and forgiving to others. If you're giving God your your whole heart, if you're in love with Jesus above all else, you're much more likely to bring the tithes into the storehouse and obey all the other commands. And I could go on and on and on, but you, you see the point. The root of all else about pleasing God is giving Him, being in love with Jesus above all else in our hearts and souls and minds. Loving God is the first importance and it's our primary purpose before God. Three lessons he's given, Moses is giving the people of God there. He's saying the way forward may not be easy. It's going to be highs and lows for you. But you'll be living under the watchful eye of God every step of the way. And thirdly, you must live in obedience to his word. Fill your hearts and lives with it. Talk about it. Let it be a part of the very DNA of your being. And love Jesus above all else. And one fourth thing, he says, look in the 24th verse. I called it to your attention as I read it. He said, every place where you set your foot will be yours. He's saying there, I will see to it that you will prosper every place where you set your foot. Moses told the Israelites that they would keep God's commandments and that they would love God with all their heart and soul and being, that God would go before them and drive their enemies out and, and God would prosper them in all their ways. And that's so true. That applies to us in this, as we are in this time in between times as we celebrate the victories of the past that's just behind us, and as we look forward to the, the times that are just before us, we realize that that is so true of us. All of these things are things we need to hear. As Paul spoke to the church at Corinth, he said, these things were recorded for you to know and remember so that you not make the mistakes 
that our forefathers made so many hundreds of years before. So be it. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for challenges, challenging us this morning from your word. Father, we thank you for the victories that we can look over our shoulders and celebrate that are just behind us. Father, as we look forward, we are reminded that there is much yet to be accomplished for the accomplishing of your purposes in our lives and in our community and so much territory yet to be grasped and taken for you. God, we pray that you would take these challenges that Moses set before your people so many years ago and burn them clearly into our hearts and minds that we might indeed be challenged for the challenges before us. We pray in Jesus' name.